This afternoon I want to expound Psalm 18. Uh, The exposition is entitled, Royal Thanksgiving. Royal Thanksgiving. This particular psalm is in a class of psalms that the scholars of the Psalter refer to as a royal psalm. A royal psalm simply is a psalm that relates incidents from the life of a king. Um, For example, the 45th Psalm is uh, clearly associated with the marriage of a king for his wedding day. Um, Psalm 20 is a psalm that celebrates victory after a battle led by the king and so forth. Now this particular psalm, royal psalm 18, is a psalm of royal thanksgiving. There has been a conflict uh, leading up to the composition of the psalm, and after the conflict the psalm was written to give thanks to God for the blessings experienced. The psalm title is one of the longest, and it tells us something of the, the situation for the psalm. Psalm 18, it says, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and he said. So so this is This is a psalm giving thanks to God for deliverance from enemies. It's David's psalm. He has in mind especially divine deliverances from from King Saul who was persecuting him in his early life, uh, David's early life. Psalm Psalm 18 then you can think of as a theological post-conflict analysis. A theological post-conflict analysis. Looking back, the king says, you know, things went very, very well in the wars and the conflicts I've had in my life. And why is that? Why did things go so well for me when they didn't go well with others? And the psalm says in answer, things went well with me because... The Lord was on my side, and the Lord helped me. And therefore, praise the Lord. The predominant spirit of the psalm is thanksgiving directed to the Lord, who is ultimately responsible for all the good the king experiences. Now, a king's duties, specifically as a king, include leadership against enemies for safety of the people, and for victory. And God has an eternal plan to save his people by a great king, a king of kings. And in the redemptive history, particularly in the Old Testament history of Israel, God gave his chosen people a series of kings over the centuries. There were good kings like David. In fact, David is the exemplar of all the good kings of Israel. The the succeeding ones are generally compared to David. If they did well, the, the history says they walked in the steps of David. They had the faith of David. If they didn't do well, they were compared typically to one of the evil kings like Jeroboam, for example. So God gave his chosen people a series of kings, Saul, David, Solomon, and then Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all the kings of the north and south. And the good kings never did bring uh, utopia to Israel. And so, as good as they might have been, they whetted the people's appetite for this greatest of all kings who would save Israel from all her troubles forever. And the bad kings even more uh, showed the need that Israel had for this great ultimate king. You see, in God's promise to David, called the Davidic Covenant, 
the Lord promised this ultimate Savior King to arise in the genealogical line of David himself. In other words, this anointed one or Messiah, this Christ, would sit on David's throne, the chief of David's house, uh, his family, that is. And when we come to the New Testament, there is no question that Jesus is presented to us there as the one who fulfills the Davidic covenant and brings in the ultimate salvation. If you compare 2 Samuel 7 with Luke chapter 1, the nativity account, when Mary praises the Lord for the news that she would bear a son, uh, she borrows the exact language of the Davidic covenant and understands that her son is the king to sit on David's throne and provide the ultimate deliverance from all their enemies. So when we come to Psalm 18, a royal psalm, I believe it's true for me to tell you that Psalm 18 historically pertains to David, literally King David. But prophetically, it refers to Jesus Christ, the the King of Kings who trusted in the Lord, who found deliverance when he did trust in the Lord, and who is now glorified as a reward of his faithfulness. If you're going to appreciate Psalm 18 at a deeper level than many people who read it, you need to keep this constantly in mind. In a limited way, at a certain period in history, it is David testifying of himself and what he did and how he trusted the Lord and what he experienced and how the Lord was faithful to him and the Lord caused him to prosper. But at a deeper level, it really does ultimately refer to David's greater son, even Jesus. And that appreciation of Psalm 18 as a messianic psalm uh, gives it um, delightful profundity. So read it both ways. Read it as pertaining to David in his time and read it as fulfilled in Christ. Now the grand idea, I think, which is illustrated in Psalm 18 and which is succinctly stated elsewhere uh, is this. And the verse I have in mind is Psalm 50, verse 15, which says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Now there are three things there, of course. There is a cry to the Lord in trouble, first of all. Then there is the Lord hearing and answering prayer and delivering the one who cried from his distressing circumstances. And then thirdly, there is the praise to the Lord who saves, the soli deo gloria, that is the ultimate reason for everything. Uh, Now, we see that illustrated, that broad idea in Psalm 18, which is ultimately about Christ. Christ is the, the greatest king who cried in distress to the Lord, who experienced divine deliverance, and now is exalted above all. And of course, I'm alluding to Christ's anguish in the passion, then his resurrection from the dead in answer to his prayers, and his enthronement in heaven, and then all the worship that comes to God through this answered prayer. So keep that pattern of God's way with human beings in mind and with the church and Christ in particular as we work through the psalm. um, My exposition necessarily must be brief. There are 50 verses here and uh, at most only 50 minutes left, so that's a verse per minute. Um, I don't intend a verse-by-verse exposition, more of a section-by-section exposition. And I think the most efficient way to approach this is to have a section-by-section reading with comments interspersed. If you're, uh, if you're following the uh, outline, it's printed on the back of the bulletin. And it has nine points, which I don't expect any of you to memorize. 
But this is the train of thought I suggest to you through the 18th Psalm. It's, it's the psalm of royal thanksgiving in which the king testifies with gratitude to God for victory he's experienced. And so we see the king's security rehearsed first. Then the king's trouble. Then the king's rescuer. Then the king's rescue. Then the king's reward. Then the king praises the one who is his enabler. The, the God who helped him, in other words. And then there is a rehearsal of the king's victory, the king's glorification, and the psalm ends with the king's thanksgiving to Jehovah. So let's work through the psalm then one section at a time. First of all, the king's security in the first three verses. And here, the writer knows that With God, he is invincible. He has a sense of invincibility, not because of confidence in himself, but because he knows he has the Lord with him. Here is what the text says, starting with verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And my deliverer, my God, my strength, strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Amen. Now, this psalm is noteworthy to start with for the reason it starts with this strikingly intimate expression I will love thee or I love you or I adore you as it has been translated in other places O Lord my strength I love you that is not very common in the Old Testament scriptures that kind of talk And why does the psalmist love the Lord Jehovah? Because of the Lord's inherent goodness and the Lord's help to him. He says, the Lord is my Savior in effect. I am secure because of what the Lord is to me. And this is is an important principle. That is, that God, by his favor toward his people wins our hearts to him. Or as John the Apostle put it, we love because he first loved us. We see in this section multiplied metaphors of security. And while each one is interesting, for the most part, they tend to build on one another and the common thread that runs through them all is safety or security. Notice the eightfold repetition of the pronoun my in this passage. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, and so forth. Eight times. Which, which implies the covenantal bond the psalmist has with Almighty God. And he takes delight in this bond he has with the Lord. He is my God, my Savior, my rock, my protector. It reminds me of the Heidelberg Catechism. First question and answer. What is thy only comfort in life and death? And the answer begins. That I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so forth. Often it is asked uh, of, of people uh, when, when a person intends to do evangelism, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's so common. But everybody has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody does. You're his enemy, or you're, and that's personal, or you're his friend. And the psalmist is rejoicing that he is in a covenant of love with the Lord. 
And because the Lord has loved him and the Lord is committed to his salvation, the psalmist loves the Lord in response. Now, in verse 3, we see these three key elements which are already brought out from Psalm 50. There is the presence of prayer in distress. I will call upon the Lord, he says. And then divine deliverance. He says, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And finally, the solideo gloria that I mentioned Worship. The Lord is the one who is worthy to be praised. This is the king expressing his sense of security in his loving God. Secondly, second section, notice the king's trouble. Verses 4 to 6. And what stands out from this section to me is that the writer is both realistic about the trouble and humbly dependent on the Lord. He's realistic and humbly dependent. Look at verse 4. The sorrows of death compassed or surrounded me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about or surrounded me. The snares of death prevented me. That's prevented in the archaic sense, which means uh, we would say preceded me. The snares of death were, were in front of me, as it were. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Amen. Now, I notice two specific things about this passage. First of all, big trouble. And secondly, acceptable prayer. The trouble the psalmist in is not a pesky annoyance. It's life or death threats that he faces. It's big trouble. And he uses very poetic, expressive, evocative language to tell us about the trouble. He uses words like death and sorrows and hell. These are, these are the greatest threats to our well-being. And then it's not just a little of death or a slight risk of death or one or two ungodly people. It's, it's rather, I was, I was overwhelmed. The sorrows of death were all about me. Floods, of course, figuratively speaking, of God, ungodly men surrounded me um, and so forth. I was I was one step away from the grave where the worms would feed on my body and so forth. It was big trouble. And in that big trouble, he offered acceptable prayer to God. I called upon the Lord. This is a an idiom for prayer. I cried unto my God. You see the repetition that's so. So characteristic of Hebrew poetic literature, they mean the same thing. To call upon the Lord is to cry unto God. And when I had prayed, he heard my voice. My cry came into his ears. This is, again, poetic, a poetic way to make a theological point. God was pleased. God was aware of my petitions to him in prayer. And he was pleased that I should ask such things. In fact, he was so pleased... He granted me the things that I asked, namely, deliverance from my enemies. Now, we have the third and a longer section, which I'm calling the king's rescuer. The king's rescuer. And in this part of the psalm, he focuses on the God who draws near. So it's it's something like this. I'm here, and I'm in big trouble... So I pray to the Lord up there in his temple, his heavenly temple. The Lord hears and answers my prayer. And, and the, the manifestation of that answer is the Lord himself coming, coming to rescue me. And the Lord is here uh, described in glorious terms uh, in what? 
we may call a theophany, that is an appearance of God. And in, in, in here it's in a very poetic form. So starting with verse 7, we have a description of the Lord coming to the rescue of the psalmist. And here's that description, verse 7. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills were moved and were shaken because he was wroth, that is angry. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and a fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub, that's a glorious mighty angel, that is something like a a white stallion to God in the sky. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him, were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. At the brightness that was before him, this is the glory of God that surrounds him. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Imagine this being described. The Lord is on the move to come to the rescue of the one in distress that he loves. And even even out in front of the Lord as he draws near, there, there are cosmic disturbances and Hailstones and lightning and thunder and and the earth moving and the skies being bent out of shape because of the Lord's special presence there. Verse 13. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice. Hailstones and, and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. That is the enemies, my enemies. So the, the, the mighty warrior God is on the warpath and he's coming for the deliverance of the, the psalmist, the king who was in battle. And the Lord starts shooting the arrows at the enemy and he hits his mark every time and scatters the hordes of evil and wickedness. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. The lightning that comes from heaven to earth is like God's arrows that hit their mark. Verse 15, then the channels of the of waters were seen. This is, this is the touchdown. The Lord from heaven, as he comes down to the earth, uh, the earth is more and more disturbed the closer he gets to it. And When he's near the surface of the earth, it's like the earth cracks open at his presence. The channels of waters were seen and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. This is a highly dramatic uh, and justly so in its description of God's presence on the scene in the battle to deliver his, his, the apple of his eye, his beloved one. Now, um, first the Lord heard the prayer in verse 6, then the Lord acted in verses 7 and following. A, a theophany in the Bible is a, what is described to be a visible manifestation of God. And here it is recounted in David's amazing and repeated rescues from death. Now, these, these images of the verses we just heard are not to be interpreted in a strictly literal way. Again and again, when David was being persecuted by Saul... The Lord saved him from death. The Lord saved David from death. And these are the events David is describing. But it was in a less dramatic, providential way that it actually happened. This is an artful glorification of God 
as the mighty warrior who came to David's defense. The, this imaginative characterization is calculated to elevate our thoughts about God's greatness. And as fantastical as this description is, it is nothing compared to the reality. The, God is far greater than any creature and then all creation together, and far beyond even our most vivid imaginations of him and what he is like. No enemy can stand against him even for a moment, because he is the divine warrior. When he rises up to battle, all his foes are smashed and scattered before him. So with this God, this great magnificent, omnipotent, irresistible God on his side as rescuer, no wonder the king felt secure and prayed to him for deliverance. And friends, this is our God. Big thoughts of God save us from debilitating despair and cynical prayerlessness in all of our troubles. The Lord is helping me to focus these days on theology proper. And I keep coming back to this again and again because I believe it, 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 Scripture testifies to the fact that we need to have more worthy thoughts of God and His greatness and goodness than we presently have. The corollary being that unworthy thoughts small thoughts, creaturely and human thoughts of God have the most debilitating consequences in our spiritual experience. Amen? Our God is way too small. Too creaturely and too human. Well, passages like this one, this theophany in Psalm 18, are useful to... To elevate our appreciation for how great God is. The king's rescuer is the infinite. Next section of the psalm. Verses 16 to 19 describe the king's rescue itself. Let me read it. And here, I think even though the man writing is a king in his own right, he is admitting his vulnerability to harm without God's help. Verse 16, speaking of the Lord. He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. They prevented or preceded me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. So the psalmist has mentioned defeated enemies. In verse 14, scattered by the Lord's arrows and lightning. And in this section, he describes the deliverance itself as it happened. The way he conceives of his, his rescue from mortal enemies is that God reached down from heaven and pulled him up out of the flood of un ungodly men who would have killed him. Mentioned in verse 4. God, by his powerful divine act, removed the psalmist from superior enemies. God preserved David in a day of calamity. And God is the one who, who was responsible for ushering the king into a large place, which is a, another idiom that means a place of freedom, blessing, and safety. It's all God here. Look, I was, I was this close to utter ruin. But the Lord acted on my behalf. He did it. He saved me. That's the sense and the drift of the four verses in this section. The king's rescue is completely 
the Lord's doing. Now, the end of verse 19 is somewhat transitional to the next section because it says, because he delighted in me. You see it? Second line of verse 19. He delivered me, that is, the Lord delivered me because he delighted in me. And the next section describes the the king's reward for his integrity. His reward for his integrity. And it has two subsections. First of all, in verses 20 to 24, there's a strong emphasis on the correlation between the psalmist's personal integrity and the Lord's acting favorably and powerfully on his behalf. The second subsection is verse 25, 6, and 7, which makes a broad makes broad generalizations from specific observations. Let's just read it first and I'll elaborate here. Verse 20. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. Notice that. According to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, He hath recompensed me. Paid me back is the idea. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Unlike the enemies opposing David, they were the sinners. David was the saint. For all his judgments were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him. And I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, in his eyesight. Now, um, this is, has a, a, um, a definite correlation to King David historically. And his basic trust in the Lord and his integrity. You remember, for example, how that when Saul was king and David was only king in waiting, uh, that, that providence gave David a couple opportunities to kill King Saul. And from on, on the basis of righteous principle, um, David would not lay a finger on Saul. He said, he's the Lord's anointed. I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to wait for the Lord to save me. And and uh, and then um, again and again, God delivered him as a reward for his faith. The truly righteous, that is, those who are favored by God, are justified in their hope of later deliverance. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. When when we as Christians have the evidences of a new heart and the gracious Holy Spirit animating us in divine service, that is to worship and serve the Lord, we have every justification for uh, assurance of final salvation because God has already been gracious to us in in so far as he has changed us and made us people of integrity. But this has a more profound correlation to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the epitome of God's righteousness, who keeps the terms of the covenant of works and receives the reward of that covenant to the obedient ones, even eternal life. Now the next part of the psalm, which is still describing the king's reward makes some broad generalizations from these specific observations. This is called inductive reasoning. So, having just rehearsed how the Lord responded to David's integrity with deliverance of David, um, the, the principle is stated more broadly starting in verse 25. Look at the text here. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful with an upright man thou wilt show thyself 
upright. That is the Lord. With the, with the merciful man, God will show himself to be a merciful God. With the upright man, God will show himself to be an upright God. With the pure, that is with the pure man, God will show himself to be pure toward that man. And with the froward man, that's a term that means contrary. The, 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 it, 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 it connotes moral depravity. With the sinful, evil man, uh, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. This is a very interesting passage. First of all, David is characterizing himself as one of those who are merciful, upright, pure, and afflicted, and his enemies as being froward or contrary, and with having high looks. And all of this makes sense to us. You know, God is merciful, God is upright, God is pure, until we get to the fourth line, which says, God will be froward to the froward person. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's not easy to grasp, but other translations have attempted something that comes across well to the English readers, like, for example, the Tanakh, which says, with the perverse, you are wily. And in another translation, the NIV says, with the devious, you show yourself shrewd. Now, there's no sin in God being shrewd or wily, but there is sin in the enemies of God, which are froward or perverse or devious. And, and so the, the striking justice of all this divine treatment comes out from the repetition of the same words. It's like saying, whatever you are to God, that's the way God's going to be to you. If you're faithful to God, He will be faithful to you. If you're, you're loyal to God, He will be loyal to you and so forth. But if you're, you're one of the devious, perverse thinking ones who are an enemy of God, who think you're going to trick God out of what He deserves from you, you're going to find out God is going to be wily toward you. He's going to, the joke's going to be on you at last, you see. The Lord is going to be an enemy to you since you were an enemy to him. That's basically the idea. And that the poetic justice of it all is obvious. God's treatment of men is just, and that appears from the correspondence of their character and conduct with the Lord's treatment. Look at verse 20 of the psalm here. It uses the phrase, according to. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. There's a correspondence between the, the one being judged in his character and conduct and what he receives from the Lord himself. This according to idea is a key phrase of an inviolable principle. And... Uh, and I have to be careful not to get bogged down here, but this so impressed me. Let me show you a couple cross-references. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10. And these are statements, I think, that would be shocking to many modern Christians if they hadn't come across them before. Jeremiah seventeen ten. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. That is, uh, the inmost being of a person. Same thing as the heart. I, I search the heart, I test or try or evaluate the inner being, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. This is impressive because it's, it, this is the Lord's policy for everybody. You see, to give every man, every man according to his, his character and conduct. That's the way I treat people, the Lord says. According to, on Judgment Day, it will be according to their character and conduct. 
Romans chapter 2 verse 6. This does not change in the New Testament. I don't know why it would, but some people think that way. Galatians chapter 2. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 2 verse 6. God will render to every man according to his deeds. And the the principle is elaborated here. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, God will render eternal life. But to them who are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, God will render, it's implied, indignation and wrath, tribulation and and anguish upon every soul of man that does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. Galatians chapter 6 states it very forcefully, this principle of according to. Galatians 6 verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And Revelation chapter 20, I have to show you. Verses 12 and 13. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. There are some false teachers in the visible church who would tell you, that this according to their works justice of God only applies to unbelievers. It's not true. Again and again the scripture says that this is the way God judges all people according to their works. This emphasizes His justice without denying His grace. The saints' works are good And so he receives a reward, but his works are good, and the reward comes on account of God's grace, not as a meritorious payment. Nevertheless, the judgment is according to their works, both in the case of the Christian and the unbeliever. Well, next section of Psalm 18 is about the king's enabler. Verses 28 to 36. Now I know that the word enabler has sort of a negative connotation, but I couldn't think of a better term. What what the king is doing, the human king here in the psalm is doing, is to say, yes, I did fight uh, in the battle, and I did win in the battle. But I want to tell you that the Lord was the one who deserves the praise Because he was enabling me or he was in me. He was the one who strengthened me and so forth to accomplish what I have accomplished. So instead of boasting of victory, the king credits the Lord God. Look at verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by thee, see that? Prepositional phrase, by thee. By thee I have run through a troop. And by my God have I leaped over a wall. This is what soldiers do in battle. They run through a troop of soldiers. They uh, leap over a wall. As for God, verse 30, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler. That's like a shield to all those who trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet, that is a deer, and sets me upon my high places. 
He teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation and thy right hand hath holden me up. That is, has held me up. And thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me that my feet did not slip. This is the interplay of divine enablement with human activity. And he's saying, look, um, I indeed I did triumph as a warrior, but God deserves all the credit for it. Without denying the fruit of grace in his life, the king credits the giver of that grace, namely the Lord. He says, God enlightens me, verse 28. He strengthens me, verse 29. He teaches me, verse 30. He steadies me, verse 31. He secures me, verse 32. He elevates me, verse 33. He trains me for battle, verse 34. He protects me, verse 35. And he upholds me, verse 36. Look, this isn't boasting in himself. This is boasting in the Lord. It is no humility, but ingratitude to God. To talk only in terms of your weakness and your sinfulness. Maybe reformed people are especially prone to make this mistake. To say, oh well, you know, I'm just a sinner, that's all, and I am weak. I can't do anything in myself. And that's all we say. Look, it is right to confess God's blessings of grace in you and for you as long as you constantly and sincerely praise Him for them. You know, it's a, it's a mock humility to deny that you're not the same person morally you used to be. It's not, it's not sinful or wrong to say, God has blessed me. And I do certain things that are right and good, but, but it's God that works in me to do those things, you see. That's in effect what the king is doing here. He's acknowledging the reality and the practical effect of God's grace in his life. We're too quick, I think, sometimes to jump to the accusation that someone is boasting if they, if they humbly acknowledge that they do have gifts and graces for ministry, for example. Or, you know, that, that they have been a good husband or a good wife or good parents or a good employee or a good teacher, whatever it is you do. But just make sure that when you when you own up to the blessings of God in your life, the stress is on the Lord is the one who deserves alone the praise for your gifts and graces. Maybe this is one reason why some Christians seem to be perennially depressed. Because they don't, they don't appreciate how much God has blessed them and is blessing them in their present experience. All they think to say is, well, I am weak and I'm sinful and I don't deserve anything and, and I fail and I, I'm this and that. I'm a sinner like everyone else. That's, that's not a biblical balance. If the Lord has changed your heart and given you a new life, Praise Him for it. Admit it to yourself and to others. As the king does here. Next. The king's victory in this section 37 to 42. The king's victory. Uh, This victory of which he speaks was both fought for by the king and granted by God. And you see that in these verses. Look at verse 37 as we draw this exposition to a close. I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn again till they were consumed. I have wounded them that were not able to rise. They are fallen under my feet. Okay, so just look at, look at that much for now. And well, consider verse 42. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind. I did cast them out as the dirt in the streets. So here, 
we could summarize the message as the king saying, I fought and I prevailed. That's what he's saying. He's, he's telling about what he did and how well he did it and how it worked. He had success. He emphasizes human actions in these verses. I have pursued. I have overtaken. I didn't turn back. I wounded them. I beat them. I cast them out. I persisted in fighting the enemy until the enemy was no more. You know, th th those people misunderstand things who diminish human responsibility by emphasizing God's sovereignty. Now, God's sovereignty is primary. And it indeed has a great emphasis in Scripture, but not to deny human action and human responsibility. The classic text, theologically, I think, on the interplay of divine sovereignty and human action must be Philippians 2, 12 and 13. And while this is speaking more about spiritual life than, you know, battlefield success and glory, it says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's the human side. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's the encouragement we have. As we step out in faith to obey God's commandments, we can count on the Lord to help us to prevail in faith, obeying his word. So the second, second aspect of the king's victory in this section of the psalm is to praise the Lord as the ultimate uh, giver of victory. Look at uh, verses um, 39 uh, where it says, For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried, but there was no one to save them. Even to the Lord, but he answered them not. So this is the other side of the coin. Yes, I fought, but it all would have been in vain except for the fact that God was at work in me against my enemies. And when they came to the point where they were in distress because they knew it, that they were facing imminent death on the battlefield, then they cried out to the Lord, Lord, save us! But you, Lord, you wouldn't listen to them. You let me prevail over them by not answering their prayers. What, what the human eye can see in the life of this world is only a part of what's really happening. There's an invisible spiritual realm of God and angels and demons. And the believers know that the visible part is only half the story, not even the most important half. So here the psalmist emphasizes the divine blessing on his efforts. The secret power at work through visible means known only by faith. And also by the results. Because the psalmist had victory in battle, he knew that God gave him the victory. Otherwise it wouldn't have happened. Every day's events unveil God at work in ordinary things. Have you ever thought about life that way? The future is hidden to us for the most part, except what God has told us about it, which is very little. So the future is hidden to us. And then this day passes, and at the end of the day, you know what God planned from eternity to happen this day. And you, but you don't know about tomorrow, you don't know about Monday. And when Monday comes and goes, oh, now you know a little bit more about what was the future, what was God's plan. Events unveil God at work in all things. It's like the Calvinist fell down the stairs and at the bottom all bruised up. He said, well, I'm glad that's over. Because it was planned. The fact that it happened is proof that it was planned. I hope you think that way. That's scriptural. Now, 
Look at the next to last section. The king's glorification in verses 43 to 45. Where in, in this mode of prayer, the psalmist says to God, Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen. A people whom I have not known shall serve me. As soon as they shall hear of me, they will obey me. And the strangers shall submit themselves unto me. The strangers shall fade away and be afraid out of their close places. So this is going beyond just survival in a war or even conquering another people in war. This is telling about how the king and the victors were glorified over their opponents. Not only was his life and kingdom preserved, in other words, and opponents quashed, but David's enemies became his loyal subjects. And historically what that means is David, after he won the battles, imposed a tax upon his upon the enemies who were now conquered. In, in other words, they had to pay regular tribute in money to King David. And this tended to weaken their kingdoms and strengthen David's reign. But spiritually... This, this passage is rich because it is ultimately of King Jesus who is glorified over and above his enemies and triumphing over them. King Jesus is glorified by God in his resurrection from the dead, his exaltation to heaven, his enthronement at the Father's right hand, his return in glory and power to this world. And King Jesus is also being glorified uh, in the wake of his spiritual victory by conversions of sinners to God and by condemnations uh, that will occur on Judgment Day. I am reminded of Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. There's so much implied by this and included in this that we cannot... Uh, There's no end to describing it. It says, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted Jesus, the crucified Savior, and hath given Him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen. Listen. In God's plan, which is as sure as any, as sure as, as God is sure because He planned it, every single human being is going to glorify God by confessing that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That doesn't mean every person will be saved, but it means those who used to be enemies of Jesus will receive the gift of faith and confess Jesus as Lord to their deliverance from, from sin. And those who persist in impenitence all the way to the day of judgment, when they see Jesus on the throne, they will be constrained to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord in their defeat. And Christ will be glorified over even those who go into eternity as his enemies. The last section of Psalm 18, verses 46 to 50, is the king's thanksgiving. The ultimate purpose of trouble and answered prayer is this. The the glory of God, the thanks to be given Him in praise. Look at verse 46. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. It is God that avengeth me, and subdueth the people under me. He delivereth me from mine enemies. Yea, Thou liftest me up above those that rise up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore will I give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and sing praises to Thy name. Great deliverance giveth He to His King, and showeth mercy to His anointed, to David and to His seed forevermore. So so the praise begins with this statement. The Lord lives. That is, Jehovah 
really exists. And He is active in the world. And He keeps His promises and delivers those who trust in Him and punishes the evildoers. And then the psalm concludes with this resolve of thanksgiving. I will give thanks to Thee, that is to the Lord, among the heathen. My gratitude, he says, will be expressed in the most public way and setting. Now in this age, that praise to God certainly includes the worship of the church gathered in a public place like this. And it also includes missionary activity. When he says here, I will give thanks to thee, O Lord, among the heathen. This this anticipates the day that would come after Christ's first advent in which he would commission the church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When the Christian church sends preachers everywhere around the world proclaiming Jesus as Lord, this is, is this. This is the saved one's giving thanks to the Lord among the heathen. It's missionary activity. And finally, this public praise to the Lord has its realization on Judgment Day. And I just, in closing, want to point out the psalm ends in verse 50 with this this mention of God's King, the Anointed One. The word anointed is, an, is the same as the term the Messiah or the Christ to David and to his seed forevermore. The ultimate seed of David, the ultimate anointed king who is both delivered by God and the deliverer of God's people is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. I conclude with uh, Isaiah 9. Uh, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen? Amen. 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 May the Lord bless our study this afternoon of Psalm 18. And may Jesus Christ, Son of David, King of God's Israel, be glorified forever and ever. Now let us pray to the Lord. Our Father, if even the celebrated King David owned that he was utterly dependent upon you for deliverance from his enemies, for salvation from his perils and dangers, uh, surely, Lord, we are one with him. Uh, it, it is true that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Likewise, called upon God for help in his trouble. And you, Lord, heard his prayer and answered him. And so we make our petitions daily to you. Uh, instead of being anxious for anything, by, with thanksgiving uh, and supplication, we make our request known to you. Uh, the God who uh, guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus and gives us your peace when we have believed you and asked for your favor and then wait in hope for the answer to our prayers. And so, Lord, 
hear our prayers this day for uh, believers in distress, for the congregation as a whole. We ask in your mercy you would be pleased to revive us and to uh, revitalize the people and the ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. We ask for an increase in our capacity to worship you and to serve others for the sake of Christ. We also, Lord, pray for our brethren in many places. We remember Pastor Ron Baines, very, very sick with a rapidly spreading uh, brain tumor, uh, worsening fast. Have mercy upon him, Lord. We we want to also mention uh, Wes Nevish in particular, uh, who has lost his main job just in the last week and had a traumatic experience on Monday that still has him rattled. Lord, calm him. Let him know in his experience more and more what it means to trust you. Give him your wisdom to know how he should steward these circumstances and guide him uh, toward in, in a righteous way toward a resolution of the matter. And um, Father... We want to remember as well Marie Gustafson, who suffered uh, the loss of her dear friend Med Tibbetts, who died this week. Comfort her. Uh, Thank you, Lord, that this elderly lady, Med, had a Christian testimony and uh, that we, her friends, have the hope that she is now with the Lord and uh, and happy in Christ. And uh, there are many other... uh, Circumstances in our lives, Lord, for which we are concerned, uh, and other people on our minds, like Richard Godfrey in the Texas prison, who, who is uh, enduring sweltering conditions in the summertime. Uh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, but we know, Lord, that you are in every place, and that you hear the cries of your people, and that as soon as your purposes are realized in our trials you will deliver us out of them and we will be blessed we praise you together lord for such confidence as we have uh, that you love us and lord we say with the psalmist we love you too Uh, we love you lord and uh, we bless you for showing us the favor that you already have and our praise comes to you in jesus name Amen. Amen. Well, our last hymn for this afternoon, 598, There Is No Night in Heaven. The Bible largely characterizes heaven by how different it is from our experience in this present world under a curse. Heaven has no night. Heaven has no grief, no sin, and no death. Its blessings are much greater than we can comprehend. All the faithful therefore make our pleas to Jesus that he will lead us through this present night and through the grief, the sin, and the death of life in this world to the glory of the next. 598, please stand.